been a pillar of the community. He helped a lot of the people who were down on their luck. He was changing everyone's life. He is senselessly murdered. We noticed what looked like burn marks. Is this a torture type crime? Was he actually tortured? Detectives follow a trail of evidence. I noticed my dad's truck was gone. We knew that this truck was a key to solving this homicide. That reveals devastating betrayals. Hardy would employ people from drug rehab centers. You look at him and you're thinking that if anybody could do it, this guy could do it. Then a surprise lead reveals a killer no one imagined. I told you guys everything I knew. No, you haven't. We're pretty excited. We're just about to go nuts. It was a moment, I'll say that. I never thought he would do something like that. He's not the guy I would have picked to have committed this crime. I was in complete shock. Ardmore, Oklahoma is an honest, hardworking town built on family values. Well, we're a town of about 25,000 people, and it's a wonderful community. It's a great place to live because you can have that large town feel and then yet come home to the small town atmosphere as well. On the evening of November 15th, 2019, that small town feeling is shattered when police respond to a 911 call. I had just sat down to eat when the phone rang and it was dispatch advising me that officers were out on a possible homicide. Police are checking in on a local man who hasn't been seen or heard from in several days. They arrived, immediately looked in the window, could see the victim was laying face down in the floor, and they could see blood. So they forced their way into the residence. They knew immediately that he was deceased. Minutes later, homicide detectives arrive at the scene. The living room was just in disarray. There was items kicked over. There was blood on the couch. There was blood spatter on nearby items in the living room, the TV and pictures. And so we knew that there was a struggle that had taken place in that room. When the detectives look at the body, they recognize the dead man. I knew the victim. It was Marty Lucas. Most of the police officers knew who Marty was. Marty helped in the community. He helped a lot of the people who were down on their luck. Marty was a, a nice guy. Detectives have to determine why 63-year-old Marty Lucas would be the target of such a heinous crime. With the amount of trauma that Marty had suffered, it was a pretty violent, bloody scene. You can see a lot of blood that has pooled around the body. You can see blood on the back of the body, on the head, and we knew that this was a death as a result of a beating or a blunt force trauma. It's obvious that there was quite a struggle. Marty had hair in his hands. He had abrasions on his hands. I think he fought for his life. We noticed that there were pieces of what appeared to be a rock that had some moss on them. We found parts of it over by the couch where there was a large blood stain, and then parts of it over by him. We walked the exterior of the residence trying to find where maybe a rock would have come from. Immediately under the carport, there is a rock pathway. The walkway was missing a rock. So immediately we thought, well, whoever it was that did this took a rock from there and brought it with him. That indicated to us that this was premeditated. And so we believed that he or she had used it as a weapon against Marty, and, and in the process of that, it was broken. We didn't find very large pieces of it, and so we believe that the, the majority of that rock was taken from the scene. Police discover unusual markings on the body. We noticed what looked like burn marks on his shirt, like his shirt had been ironed. My initial reaction was not only has he been hit by an iron, he's been burned by an iron. Is this a torture type crime? Was he actually tortured? And so we believe maybe early on that the iron could have been a murder weapon, in, or at least an additional murder weapon in this case. But what could have been the motive for such a violent attack? where his wallet would have been. Someone had reached in and taken his wallet. Cause you could see the blood transfer, a handprint, like sliding down into his pants almost. We were pretty clear that this was a crime involving a robbery and theft. His wallet was missing along with his phones. Detectives make one more important observation. We thought whoever had killed Marty knew him because there wasn't a sign of forced entry. 
As investigators work, Marty's son Michael arrives at the scene. I went to his house. It was a nightmare. It's the worst day of my life. I was in shock once I seen what was actually inside. My husband called me. He said, my dad's dead. Someone killed him. And he was just screaming in my ear. He's like, I can't believe someone would kill my dad. I was in complete shock. He was such a nice person. Who would want to hurt him? Marty Lucas was born into a military family in 1956. After graduating high school, Marty got married and had two children, Jennifer and Michael. Michael and his dad were very, very close. He loved his family. He was always there for everyone, you know. He made sure to make time for everyone. I used to call him Papa Smurf because he's just really funny, he's short. He's just a real, you know, bubbly person. My parents, they divorced when I was pretty young. Marty had struggles when my husband was a child and a teenager. He had a substance abuse problem. He had been in and out of trouble with the police, petty crimes that was a result of that addiction. In 2007, Marty got a second chance when he was offered a job as a carpenter and found renewed purpose in life. From then on, he straightened up and started his own business. Did really well. He turned his life around. He is one of the few success stories that I'm aware of in my career. Marty threw everything into rebuilding his life and his family. He taught me a lot of work-related skills at an early age. He let me start working with him when I was 12 years old. And my son, he's eight. He's already starting working him, basically, showing him skills like he did me when I was young. He was the best grandpa I could ever ask for for my kids. Marty never forgot the second chance he'd been given and vowed to pay it forward. Marty would usually go to the halfway houses and get people that had just got out of jail or they have a hard time with their life and see if they would want to work for him. Basically, just giving workers second chances. He knew where they was coming from. He's been in their shoes. He taught these men and women new skills. He treated them with the utmost respect. Now investigators are left asking, who would want to bludgeon this well-respected contractor and caring grandfather to death? He really had no enemies. And just to see that the way that he died was so brutal, it was very difficult to know that someone would be capable of doing something like that. As detectives finish up at the crime scene, they turn to Marty's son, who gives them a crucial lead. When I showed up, I noticed that my dad's truck was gone. That really threw me off, because he wouldn't even let me drive his truck. He wouldn't loan the truck out to no one. It was a Chevy pickup that originally had belonged to Marty's father. That truck was everything to him. Detectives put out a bolo, or be on the lookout for the missing truck. We needed to find the truck and maybe hope that either the suspect was still driving it or that they left behind evidence that we could identify him. We knew that this truck was a key to solving this homicide. Investigators ask Marty's loved ones who they think would have seen him last. We found out that Marty had been missing two or three days prior to the Friday the 15th that we found his body. And one of the things we were told by family and friends is that Marty goes to this Valero gas station every morning to get coffee. The Valero had video that pointed down the street that the crime occurred on. The manager said that Marty had arrived last at that store on Tuesday morning. Detectives search the security footage. On the day after Marty was last seen alive and three days before his body was found, the truck appears. Marty's truck was very unique, dark green color with custom wheels. This green truck was in a big hurry and it pulled out in front of a semi truck and it was almost into in an accident that we had captured on video. Investigators need to track down Marty's truck and whoever is behind the wheel. We thought if we find the truck, we're probably going to find our suspect. This is going to be our guy. Coming up, detectives uncover suspects with dark pasts. They said, violent. I thought, good Lord, he gets violent. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> she had frequented in a lot of the local casinos. She knew he had large sums of cash. I that this was the break that we needed. And the trail leads to an unlikely killer. You're not going to think that this is someone who could kill somebody. And that kind of broke open a whole new layer of the case. 
the investigation took off at warp speed because we think we've got our guy. Police investigating the murder of 63-year-old contractor Marty Lucas have obtained gas station surveillance video of someone driving his truck the day after he was last seen. We collected hours and hours of video from the store. We were able to piece together some events that happened before and after the homicide. The footage shows a busy street a few blocks from Marty's house. When detectives scour the rest of the security tapes, something grabs their attention. On Wednesday morning, just after daylight, you can see a gentleman walking from the direction of Motel 6. And that person was walking towards Marty's home. Is this unidentified man involved in Marty's murder? You can see the suspect. Then an hour later, you can see on the video that there's one guy in the truck, that there's a single person in the truck. And so we thought he might be the same person that was in that video. Marty did not allow just anyone to drive this truck. In fact, he did not allow anyone to drive this truck. We had to follow the stolen truck. That was really going to be our key to solving this case. While officers continue their search for the truck, detectives return to speak to Marty's family and friends. That's one of the things we were trying to just nail down is, who has Marty been hanging out with lately? Who has he been working with? Who has he had problems with, if anyone? Police learn that along with helping people back up on their feet, Marty often forged friendships with those he employed. Marty would become close with some of the men that he worked with or that he would hire and try to get to know them. There's probably about six or seven of them I actually got pretty close to. He built up friendships with them. Amanda and Jason, Marty's neighbors, were very close to him. Amanda used to work for Marty because she paints very well. He didn't look down on me for, you know, I was trying to get my life back on track. And he told me he, you know, he did it, so you can do it. Marty would bring a lot of these folks to family dinners or get together. He tried to bring them into his family. But now, police want to know, had Marty's generosity and business exposed him to danger? He paid all of his people in cash. And that's just the way it is in the day labors with those guys. Uh, they, need, they need money that day, so they're going to work. And everything's cash. To know that he could pay them daily with cash and help them out may have led to his demise. Police also discover not all Marty's employees felt like part of the family. It wasn't an easy road for Marty because sometimes he would have to tell them that they couldn't work for him anymore because they would steal from him. Anytime you're working with people who have drug and alcohol problems, it's not uncommon for them to steal from their employers. And Marty had faced some of that. He wasn't afraid to stand up to these people. He would tell them, if you, you know, if you mess up, you're gone. So our list of suspects was a mile long. We were given several names, but yeah, it was so difficult for investigators because it was going to be hard to track them down. Where they were staying, they usually don't keep jobs very long. As detectives begin tracking down Marty's current and former employees, they ask his neighbor if anyone had a grudge against him. Well, I initially went to interview Amanda, and she said, you know, over the last month or so, there's been some rough-looking characters over there. One month before his death, he had been hanging out with these new people, and they were helping him work on his truck and then had to redo the job. She thought maybe there had been some anger issues between the victim and those guys. The day they were there working, Marty seemed to be pacing back and forth like they were taking too long and he didn't want to, you know, leave them at his house. They were making too big of a mess. He was upset about that. Amanda didn't know the men, but had overheard Marty talk to the man in charge. One was a guy named Junior, and so this was someone that we wanted to speak with. There's just one problem. We did not know who Junior was. We knew this to be probably a nickname, and that's all we really knew. While detectives plan to search for Junior, Amanda also provides them with the name of another one of Marty's former employees. Marty met Chris Dyer at Valero, the local convenience store that he went to nearly every morning to get a cup of coffee. Chris had recently been fired from that store, had a falling out with the owner, and Marty had employed him. 
I know Chris Dyer had worked for Marty, had been fired from there for drug use. He'd had a criminal past. He'd been arrested in an addiction problem with drugs and alcohol. Officers speak with the owner of the Valero station where Chris once worked. The owner manager of the Valero store reaffirmed that Chris was just not a very good guy, that he had had trouble employing him. And so he felt like that he needed to let Chris go because there was always drama, that Chris was basically just at rock bottom and desperate for money. Chris Dyer knew that Marty carried several hundred dollars when he paid him for a job. He would pay him at the end of the day, and he would pay him with cash. Was Chris Dyer desperate enough to bludgeon Marty Lucas to death? We were thinking that maybe it was a robbery gone bad, knowing that Marty had this money in his home because he was down on his luck and needed money for drugs. And so there was a lot of questions concerning Chris Dyer. One of our main priorities early on in the investigation is to find this subject named Junior, along with Chris Dyer, and so we, we wanted to... Chasing multiple leads as they search for his killer and stolen truck. They've set their sights on two of Marty's employees, an unidentified man called Junior and a recently fired laborer named Chris Dyer. A lot of these folks who are going through tough times, there is nothing permanent in their lives. There is nothing fixed in their lives. There is no stability. And so it was hard to track them down. Following a lead, Police questioned employees at the gas station where Chris had worked. I spoke with the clerk that was on duty at the Valero, and she was able to give me a phone number to Gina Dyer. Gina is Chris's estranged wife. She and Chris had been separated about a month because she had caught him cheating. He had gone back to drug use, and that he was currently living at the Econo Lodge Hotel. Detectives find Chris at the hotel and bring him in for an interview. We really thought that we had something. We knew that Chris had easy access to Marty's home. Chris Dyer knew that Marty carried up to five to six hundred dollars in cash on him at, at any given point in time. So there's a rumor that um, some rumors went around that maybe you and him had gotten crossways and he had basically fired you. So so you never had a disagreement. No, not at all. Nope. I'd like to know who in the hell saying that, because that's bullshit. <laughs> Pardon my friend. Police know better than to trust Chris's word. We knew that Chris Dyer is down on his look and had run-ins with the law. And well, maybe this is our killer. This is who it is. And then you get him in an interview room, and he's cooperative, and he's genuine. In fact, he was very distraught over Marty's death. I hope you catch who the hell did it to fry their ass. Yeah, I know, right? He was, man, that guy would do anything for anybody. He had some empathy there because he'd been in trouble before, too. And damn sure, damn sure didn't deserve to go out like that. I think he considered Marty a friend, even though Marty had fired him. Would you be willing for us to, to go through your truck, look through your truck, look through your hotel room, just yeah, see if there's yeah. anything that would be, yeah, I got that we can roll you out? Marty had what we would consider defensive wounds to the hands. There was hair and blood under the fingernails of the body. And so we knew that there was some type of altercation. We knew that there had to be injuries on our suspect or suspects. And Chris had none of that. He had no recent cuts or bruises. In order to officially rule Chris out as a suspect, detectives check Chris's alibi. He said he had gone to Kingston, Oklahoma, which is nearby with Krista, his girlfriend. I believe it was the Wednesday before. Police bring Krista in for an interview. Is it possible that he slipped out of the room one night uh, while you were sleeping, left, did, went and did something? No. I have to say that just could not be possible. His girlfriend also corroborated Chris's timeline as to what his story was. He had an alibi for that timeline, but he just didn't appear to be involved. With nothing to link Chris to the murder, police are forced to let him go. Investigators hope Marty's preliminary autopsy report will provide more leads. The significant thing for us from the autopsy was the fact that the cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head, including the large gash to his head. Obviously, he was hit with something other than the rock because of the laceration on his head and because of the burn marks. 
these burns that was on his back and part of his right arm came back as a post-mortem burns, which was very interesting to us, which means that they were caused after Marty had passed away. Initially, we were looking at these burns to the body as being type of a torture. Now, we believe the iron was used as a secondary weapon after. So the suspect didn't realize that in his rage, he didn't know that Marty had already died and he continued to hit him with this iron. The preliminary autopsy report doesn't conclude whether the rock or iron ultimately killed Marty and an exact time of death remains undetermined. Meanwhile, with the killer still at large, the worry takes a toll on Marty's family. His son, Michael's always a quiet person, but he was like a walking zombie. I couldn't sleep at night. I'd stay up during the day. I was fear for my family. Uh, just because, like, I had no clue who would do this to my dad. Michael was really panicked. Marty had so many different men working with him. I was very fearful of my life. As police continue their search for other suspects, including the former employee, Junior, who worked on Marty's truck, a lead comes in about someone close to Marty who might have had a motive. One of Marty's friends had called one of our patrol officers and told him that Marty was dating a lady named Donna Hargrave. So Donna Hargrave is somebody that probably everybody at the Armour Police Department is familiar with and knows on site. We knew Donna had a drug problem as well. She did have a few run-ins with police and frequented a lot of the local casinos. Could Donna's vices have pushed her to murder Marty? She knew Marty and knew that he had large sums of cash and because she is a known drug user, that perhaps she had enlisted the assistance of another known drug user to go rob Marty. That was a scenario obviously had some possibility to it. That's why we needed to talk to Donna as quickly as possible. Officers bring Donna down to the police department for an interview. Upon bringing her into the interview room, she was handcuffed and I knew that she had not come up there willingly. What's this about? Yes, if I'm not under arrest, then why do y'all have a reason to search me? She was really uncooperative. She did not want to speak to us. OK, what is this about? Please get so, us over here and tell me what this is about. OK, so. Somebody uh, who I've been hanging with. Yeah. OK, who? Marty Lucas. That's straight up. She Police are interviewing his former girlfriend, Donna Hargrave a woman with a long criminal history and a grudge against Marty. She had been arrested many times here in Ardmore. She had been known to be at least uncooperative with police, if not somewhat violent and unruly. She didn't really care too much for Marty. We thought maybe she had something to do with his, with his death. You pissed me off because he was just being a dickhead. So when you said him, what were you mad at him about? He just promised things and don't ever fall through. Like I talked to Marty about, about moving my trailer over to him. Over to his house or something. He said no. He knew that she had not been clean and that she had not been trying to straighten up and that he wasn't going to help her as long as she wasn't trying to help herself. Could Marty's rejection have led Donna to do something unthinkable? So if I were to tell you something bad happened to Marty, what would you say? What do you mean? What's wrong with him? Well, if I, if I were to tell you he was dead, someone did something to him, what would you say about that? Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. This was a girl that was very hardened, and for her to break down and to cry and was very genuinely upset over Marty's death. She did say that they had recently broken up and that she hadn't seen him any time in the last four, five, seven days. Can you kind of start like maybe Wednesday morning tell me where you were, what you did, where you, where you went? At my mom's and I slept all day. 
Okay. We were able to pretty quickly corroborate where she had been. It was unlikely that she had anything to do with his death. However, we did not rule her out immediately. Days after Marty's gruesome death, his family and friends come together to say their goodbyes. Marty's funeral was amazing. It was very, very sad, though, because everyone who knew him knew that he didn't deserve anything ever bad to happen to him. Everyone loved Marty. Everyone. There was quite a bit of his workers, even his past workers, that come to his funeral. It was a good day, but a bad day at the same time. Meanwhile, police doggedly follow each and every lead. We did have a large suspect pool because we didn't know who all might have been working for Marty. One of the things that we wanted to get identified was who Junior was that was working on the truck. So myself and another investigator said, we'll run by the halfway houses and see if we can get Junior identified. So we went over to the Broadway house, and the director there gave us the name of Clarence Bibb Jr. He said he thought Junior was from up by Oklahoma City, and he's got a pretty extensive record, including some assault. Well, we, we really believe that if Junior and Marty had gotten into an altercation over the payment of the truck motor, maybe he took the money, it got out of hand, he killed Marty, took Marty's money and the truck, and took it back to Oklahoma City to chop it up. We found that law enforcement there knew Clarence very well. They knew his family very well. And they lived in several homes that would be described as a compound, like a family compound. And they said, don't go out there without a lot of us. Clarence is violent, and so you don't go up there by yourself. Detectives assemble a task force with local and state police and make the two-hour drive to Junior's compound. When I first got out there, I thought, man, this is a real possibility. Man, we might find our truck out here. So we went up and knocked on the door. And when Clarence showed up, I thought, good Lord, this is one large man. And if he gets violent, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> You look at him and you see what had happened to Marty, you're thinking that if anybody could do it, this guy could do it. I mean, he's big. Detectives ask if he and Marty had fallen out over the work Junior had done on Marty's truck. And he was happy with what Marty had paid him, and there was no disagreement. He said that Marty paid him $500 more than he was supposed to because of the trouble that we went through. And in fact, when I told him that Marty had died and that someone had caused his death, he too got emotional. Here, this big, mean, gruff country guy, and he's crying like a child over his friend's death. He said, you know, I wouldn't hurt Marty if somebody paid me to. He said he considered Marty a mentor and a friend. Clarence denied that he had been in Ardmore recently. He had gave an alibi that he had been at home with his mom and other family members around the time of Marty's death. And they corroborated his story that he was there. He fully cooperated with the investigation. He gave us his cell phone. He let us have clothing and boots. He let us search his house. He let us search the property. And I mean, he let us just have free reign of whatever we wanted. And we came up with nothing. I just remember thinking to myself, man, we are absolutely going nowhere with this investigation. With nothing to link Junior to the homicide, detectives begin to fear the investigation is cooling down. We had a pretty good idea that it wasn't Junior at that point. Donna Hargrave had a stone clad alibi. Chris Dyer just didn't appear to be involved. I think both Bryce and I just were disheartened. We had no leads. We had no suspects, so we were just trying to figure out where do we go from here. Then, an unexpected call turns the case red hot. Well, we got back to the station, and dispatch yells down to us, hey, they found your truck. We were dead tired, but you went from, you went from dead tired to wide awake in a hurry. into the investigation of Marty Lucas's murder, detectives get the break they were looking for, Marty's missing truck. And I remember the dispatcher telling me they found the truck. And I said, where is it? And they said, in Springdale, Arkansas. And so this was the break that we needed. We're pretty excited. We're just about to go nuts. We're like, OK, get a hold of Springdale police. Get them on the phone. Let's find out what we got going on. It was a moment, I'll, I'll say that. Investigators ask Springdale police how Marty's truck had ended up over 300 miles away. 
the citizen had called and told them that his friend had been in possession of the truck. And his friend, he identified as Jack Latham. But who is Jack Latham? Detectives immediately ask Marty's family if they know the name. They learn Jack was one of Marty's most trusted laborers who hadn't been seen or heard from in months. Jack Latham, he worked for my dad for a long time. He was a really hard worker. Marty was extremely good to Jack. He gave him extra money here and there whenever he'd need it. Marty would bring him by my house sometimes, and they would occasionally ride around together. He seemed very quiet. It was not unusual for people to come and go in Marty's business. Jack Latham worked for him on and off a couple of years prior to this. When detectives dig into Jack's background, they learn he has a daughter and ex-wife in Ardmore and a checkered past. He had an extensive criminal history for drugs and theft, but he's not the guy I would have picked to have committed this crime. Jack Latham did minor misdemeanor type crimes, drug possession type crimes, but this is not a person that would even be on the radar because he had no really violent history. So you're not gonna think that this is a guy who could kill somebody, particularly not in the manner in which Marty was killed. Investigators rush to Arkansas, where police have taken Jack into custody and seized the truck. But before speaking with Jack, they interview the man who first contacted police about the truck, Jack's friend, Raymond. Raymond, he says to us that out of the blue, Jack calls on Friday night and says that he has got court on Monday. Can he stay or the weekend? Raymond tells police Jack asked to get picked up at a local parking lot. So he goes to pick him up, and he sees he's sitting in a what looks like a pretty nice Chevy pickup. And he says, hey, you know, whose pickup is that? He said, oh, it's a guy that I'm visiting. He let me come sit in it to wait on you. And he says to us, I didn't believe him. Monday morning, Jack says, just take me to jail. I've got warrants. So he takes him to jail, and then he goes back home, and he looks to see what the warrants are for, and it's for theft. And he thinks, I wonder if that truck's stolen, because something doesn't feel right with that truck. So he goes back to where the parking lot where the truck is and sees it doesn't have tags on it. And so Raymond knew that Jack was lying. He knew he needed to call the police. We went and looked at the truck, and the truck looked pristine on the inside. But when we sprayed it with Blue Star, there was blood everywhere. We knew in the back of our minds that this was the key, that Jack Latham was the key to Marty Lucas's death. And then the investigation took off at warp speed because, yeah, we think we've got our guy. We went to the Benton County Jail and interviewed Jack that day. First thing I noticed about him is he's slight of build. He's not very big. He seems to be very reserved and meek. He doesn't seem to be what I would picture to be a killer. Then police noticed something else about Jack's appearance. He looked pretty bad. He had some injuries to his face. He had this greenish brown black eye or injury to his eye. He had some a minor abrasion to his lip. Could Jack have suffered his injuries while attacking his former boss, Marty? Police start by asking Jack when he was in Ardmore last. OK, um, I guess at some point in time, you've been in Ardmore, been around Ardmore, or lived in Ardmore or some stuff. Yeah, a long time ago, about six years ago. Jack tells detectives he's recently been living 200 miles away in Enid, Oklahoma. Who were you staying with? Uh, my brother and him. Then, investigators cut to the chase. We've been working on an investigation for the last uh, almost a week now. Your name's come up. And before I can really get into a lot of questions with you and details and explain to you, you know, why we're here and all that, um, i got to read your Miranda rights. After we Mirandized him, he said he didn't want to talk to us anymore. Do you wish to make a statement, or will you answer any questions that we have for you today? No. No? OK. With Jack refusing to talk, police need to find a way to place him near Marty's house at the time of the murder. So in his initial interview, he tells us that he hasn't been to Ardmore, that he came down here from his brother's house in Enid. I called Enid PD, and they went out. They talked with the brother. They talked with the brother's wife. They said, yes, he has been here at our house. But then detectives get a stunning piece of information Jack hadn't shared. His brother's wife said, I'd put him on the bus to go see his wife and daughter in Ardmore on the Monday morning before Marty had been killed. So we knew he had gotten to Ardmore. We, the next day, we got a hold of the bus and found out that, yes, indeed, he had been at Ardmore. With Jack still in custody, 
police drive back to Ardmore. The detectives got a search warrant and looked through Jack's phone, and that led them to his ex-wife and daughter. Did you see your dad in the truck mm -hmm. last week? Yeah. Okay. Do you understand what kind of trouble your dad's possibly in? He's been detained as a suspect in a homicide. So you for sure haven't seen your dad since he's been in Arkansas. Yeah. Investigators talk to Jack's ex-wife, Teresa, next. Has he came to visit you lately? No? I haven't seen from him or heard from him. So would it surprise you to know that Jack is involved in a homicide here in Ardmore? Yeah, because it, it doesn't seem like him. Both of them said they haven't seen Jack in Ben and Ardmore. They don't know what we're talking about. And we knew this was not true because on Jack's phone, we knew that he had called Teresa and Shelby. And during that interview with Teresa, I laid it out for her. I just flat out told her I knew she was lying. I'm not saying anything. I've told you guys everything I know. No, you haven't. Yes, sir, I have. No, you haven't. And we can prove it. It's a matter of time before we put you in that truck. We put you in that truck, it, it starts getting serious in a real quick hurry. Police start to question if Jack's ex-wife and daughter are involved in Marty's murder. At that point, she decided that she didn't want to talk to us anymore, and she and Shelby left, and I just told her, we're not going to stop. We're going to solve this crime with or without you. The only question is, where's your role going to be? Less than 24 hours later, police get a call. The next day, early morning, the next morning, Teresa had called, said, I want to come back and talk. So from that, I mean, that, that kind of broke open a whole new layer of the case. Police investigating the murder of Marty Lucas are trying to place his friend and employee, Jack Latham, at the scene of the crime. We knew that he was coming here to visit his wife and daughter. They both told investigators that they did not know where Jack was. They had not seen Jack. He had not been in Ardmore. But Jack's daughter and ex-wife returned to the police station the next day. Yesterday, you're pretty far. She didn't know nothing. I was really scared, and I thought about it all night, and I felt really bad. Really hit home, so I had to tell the truth. I did see Jack on the 11th and 12th. Which was what, Monday and Tuesday? Monday and Tuesday. Okay. And he dropped us off at my mom's house on the 13th in the morning. Teresa says Jack stayed at an Ardmore motel on Monday and Tuesday nights. They said Jack had called Marty to see if he had any work for him. And Marty said, no, I, I can't use you. I don't need you right now. And do you know what day that was? Tuesday They both said that about 8 or 8.30 on that Wednesday morning, Jack left sent an officer to Motel 6 to see if they had video. And sure enough, we've got video of Jack Latham leaving Motel 6, wearing the same clothes as the person that's walking. The Bolero camera picks up. About an hour later, a green Chevrolet truck that we believe was Marty's truck shows up in the parking lot in Motel 6. You watch him go over to a dumpster, throw something in the dumpster, which we believe was the rock and the iron. Where did he go get the truck? He said he couldn't get it to him. Then Jack did something even more suspicious. When he came in, he went straight to the sink and washed his hands. He, uh, he did wipe his face down, and he put his hoodie on, and he told me that he did something bad, but he wouldn't tell me what. He said, we got to leave. We got to get out of here. He drops them off, and they don't see him again. And so by then, yeah, we got enough to file charges on Jack Lee. I called the family members and told them what we knew. I was very shocked because Jack had been in my house around my children. He just acted very shy, but he didn't act like he would hurt anyone. It was shocking to me because he treated Jack with respect like he did everyone else. Police charged Jack Latham with first degree murder and extradite him from Arkansas. When he arrives in Ardmore, Jack starts talking. Jack told me that he was in desperate need of money, that he, he had no job, that he needed money for drugs, and he knew that Marty Lucas was the source of that money. Marty had told him no, that he knew that he wasn't clean. His story was that 
a physical altercation occurred, that he took a rock paperweight from the kitchen table, struck Marty with it, that, in his words, he freaked out, took the keys to the truck and a few hundred dollars from the wallet and left the area. Jack denies attacking Marty with a stone from outside or the iron. There were some aspects where he seemed to truly be confused about what had happened because he was strung out on drugs, including was there an iron used? So what had really happened? Police have their own theory as to how the murder played out. We believe that this was premeditated. I think he went to Marty's house, and I think he picked that rock up on the outside of the house and he knocked on the door, because I don't think he was going to take no for an answer. And when Marty told him no, a fight ensued in which he struck Marty with the rock. Uh, I think Marty fought back. He struck him with the iron, which was readily available, and then burned him with it, whether on purpose or on accident. He took the iron and he took the rock with him, and he disposed of the evidence, and he drove to Arkansas. It was absolutely senseless, over a few hundred dollars. Despite the evidence, prosecutors worry defense lawyers will try to argue Jack was desperate and never planned to kill Marty. I thought that this case met the elements from a legal standpoint of first-degree murder, but then you have to be mindful of the fact that a jury would think also Jack's explanation is somewhat believable. He's a hopeless junkie. He's desperate for money. With the family's consent, prosecutors charged Jack with second-degree murder. We didn't want to risk going to trial and then letting him free. In October 2020, Jack Latham pleads guilty and is sentenced to 25 years in prison. I feel like we got justice. I know he's going to be locked up and my family's going to be safe. Jack was very unexpected as a killer because he just didn't act like he was that type of person. Jack Latham, he's, he's still a mystery to me, you know, because just by being around him, I never thought he would do something like that. He did this for nothing. There was no reason for nothing. Marty was such a nice guy. But not only that, I mean, think of all the people whose lives he affected in a positive way. That's a sense of loss for our community. When I lost Marty, I lost my life, too. He was the most amazing person I could ever. Sorry. từng yêu 
trái một người tìm vui mãi tận trời nào ra lạnh hôn đau một người chợt nghe gió giữa mênh mông rót vào trong và một mình tôi chép dòng tâm tình tặng người chưa biết một lần vì trong phút ấy tôi tìm mình thì thầm giờ đã gặp được một nụ hoa nở về đêm Hãy subscribe 